Yes, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. When getting through the various collections and catalogues of so-called Coptic textiles, the uniformity of the complex silk weaves always puzzled me. Compound silks and their wooden predecessors come in repeating patterns that seem to be absolutely identical. Are there really no differences between the single pieces? Those two pieces, both found in Egypt, one in the British Museum and one in the Victorian Albert Museum, even got confused by specialists. So one of the questions I'm asking is, where do those pieces come from? Why are they so similar? Do they perhaps come from the same cloth? The complex fabrics I'm researching are worked in the technique of twill damask, weft faced compound tabby, also called takte, and weft faced compound twill, also called samite. With a deeper understanding of those fabrics came more and more questions. Where were those fabrics produced? What did the loom lo looms look like to repeat the pattern mechanically? Who had access to silk and to this technology as early as the 3rd to 4th century AD or even before? And what besides the silk is a connection to the Han time warp faced compound fabrics from China? I have to admit this talk does not provide any answers to those questions. This rather short glimpse into my ongoing PhD and giving an idea on how to find answers. <coughs> I'm concentrating on complex silks that have been found within the area of the Roman Empire and its successors. The time frame goes up to the early Byzantine, early Islamic age and um, to document the changes in the fabrication and distribution. The goal is to put the pieces into their historical context. Questions on diverse topics shall be answered. But the central question, of course, is to find the place, or at least the region, of production of the silks and the distribu distribution. The answers will be found, hopefully, by an intense study of textile finds but also of written sources and pictorial evidence. The early pieces from the western part of the Roman Empire were luxurious late Roman burials from the 3rd to 5th century, and they yielded complex silk fabrics. Later western complex silks are known from the early medieval reliquaries and church treasuries. Some few examples have been discovered ex at excavations in Syria and Israel. But the main amount of compound silks now stored in museums all over the world comes from Egypt. They were brought to light in the late 19th and early 20th century, and hundreds of pieces are now in the museums. Most of the silks lack a proper documentation due to their early discovery and the rush for artifacts back then. Some cemeteries are of course known for the richness of the burials and the luxury of the garments of the dead. For example, Antinoe and Achmin, both roughly dated to 39th century AD. In my research, I analyze the compound weaves visually, using binocular or transportable gear like a dynolite. A detailed decomposition is necessary to reveal the manufacturing process as well as the design process behind these fabrics including the tracing of irregularities, of course, you will see that later. Knowing how these fabrics were produced gives many details about the setup of the loom and the developments that took place in pattern weaving from the 3rd to 8th century AD. But with this diverse material, where to start? I picked one of, well, the largest group, um, it's the so-called Achmin silks, with more than 100 objects in museums' collections. They are at the latest edge of my research, dating to 7th to 9th century AD. Judging from the v linen tunic, which is preserved completely, there are sets of matching silk decorations, which once were applied to tunics, roundels, thoracically, broad rectangular decorations, which were applied to the sleeves, called maniki, this is only half of one sleeve decoration. You have to imagine a mirror pattern 
to make it whole again. And of course, the clavi ending with this tzigina. The decorations show the same central motif with leaves, tendrils, and buds. All have in common that the main pattern is framed by a border of vivid plant design. These decorations have been woven in a large silk cloth on the purpose to be cut out and used as sewn on decorations on tunics. They have a pattern repeat in weft direction. Here you see some details of a piece in the BNA that shows some irregularities in the pattern that are mirrored on the second half. Some mites feature two warp systems. A very short glimpse into technical details. I don't want to annoy you with things like that. But some things I have to mention, they have two warp systems, one for the twill binding and one for the patterning, which is called main warp. And then there are two wefts working parallel and the main warp, the pattern warp, determines which weft is seen on the front and which weft is seen on the back. So that's the main thing of samite and sauté, <coughs> which works just the same, just in tabby binding. Here, some wrong pattern shafts have been selected, and you see, for example, a cream line appearing here. It's just a wrong pattern shaft, wrong pattern thread selected, which mirrors in the mirrored pattern repeats. Orbicoli and Manike have the same width with approximately 22 centimeters and they show the uh, already mentioned mirror pattern repeat. The clavi have only half the width and show just one pattern repeat, no mirror pattern repeat. When counting the number of main warp threads, the warp for patterning, it soon became clear that these decorations have matching numbers of threads per pattern repeat. All had plus minus 215 threads per pattern repeat. Of course, I counted other patterns as well. Those had completely different numbers in the pattern repeat. So is there a possibility of all these different decoration elements being woven on the same loom and perhaps even in the same warp? <coughs> Of course, one has to check technical details first and to see if they are all the same, like twist of wool, color, etc. But if this applies and this design is the same too, they can be checked for relations. We'll see that later. First, to the question of production batches. There are several fragments which help to reconstruct the size of one production batch, as they are showing pattern repeats, weft, and warp wise. This is a detail of the tunic from the Victoria Nelvet Museum. And you can see on the clavier that the lower part is exactly the same, while the upper part, where you can see the plant moving on the butt, this part is mirrored. So we do have the roundels and we do have the rectangular pieces and mirrored clavi. One second fragment in the uh, so this is a, a repeat in the weft direction, which is mirrored again. Uh, the width of two clavi is the width of one orbiculus. One other fragment shows a pattern repeat in walk direction. As I told you, those sleeve decorations they come with two riders, a central metal yarn, and then mirrored riders. There is no central metal yarn. It's cut between two fragments. So it's one full sleeve panel down there, one full sleeve panel up there. Other fragments show similar features. So there's one orbicolus in paper in the collection of the Deutsches Textilmuseum. And there is um, a seam allowance which has been folded under the piece when it was sewn on. And when you unfold it, you see the start of the second around you and in between a very faint line. Mm. This dotted mark may be perhaps a weaving fold or maybe a cutting mark that has been missed. 
The largest piece of Achmim silk with palmet border comes from Dumbarton Oaks in Washington. It features four roundels in a row in a weft direction. And the cloth is 97, uh, 97 centimeters wide. It has no salvages, so we don't know if it was even wider. On top of the cloth, we see a second row of roundels that has been cut. So again, there's pattern repeat in weft direction and pattern repeat in warp direction. We can see that these silks have the same um, technical features and same pattern. We know they have the same number of main warp threads in one pattern repeat. We also know that several decorations were woven in one warp at the same time and that the pattern was repeated mechanically. If we take the tunic at the Victoria and Albert Museum as a blueprint for one set of decorations, we need two sleeve panels and two clavi, both with a mirrored pattern, and four orbicoli for one tunic. All of these can be woven in the same warp width. When you add them in the same warp width, you get an approximate length of 360 centimeters. Judging from the width of about one meter, including salvages, um, there can be decorations for four tunings um, being woven at the same time. Drawing in a completely preserved silk somite from St. Severin in Cologne, which has another pattern but is technically very similar, it might be even more, up to 150 centimeters with 12 pattern repeats. This is showing a little bit the amount of silk decorations that has been produced and that could be produced in one production batch. But of course, this is only a hypothesis so far. We do not yet know if the different decoration parts have been woven in the same warp, albeit the pattern width of clavi and orbicoli is a very strong indicator that it may be so. But of course, it would be also possible that only roundels were woven in one cloth and the next cloth had just sleeve panels on it, but both have been woven in the same warp setup. To prove if several decorations came from the same production batch, the weaving irregularities are an essential part of the research. The weaving irregularities would go through the full length of the warp if warp irregularity and through the full width of the weft. Several different irregularities were yet recorded. Irregularities in the material, errors that occur before the we actual weaving, and errors that occur during the weaving. These irregularities help us with the jigsaw of the objects, as we gain information on the weaving process, like the mounting, direction of weave, change of weft bobbins, and of the general setup of the loom. They form an individual pattern that helps to trace objects that once came from the same warp. Here, you will recognize again the two pieces from the first slide, the two sleeve panel halves from Victoria and Albert and British Museum. It's very interesting because both have been acquisitioned by the museums in the late 19th century, 1887, and in 1904, early 20th century, but some years apart but both show the same errors and irregularities in warp and in weft direction. For example, a double binding warp, which shows here, marked with one in the sketch, or number two, um, a change in the twill direction. So there was a miscounting during the warping. This affects just the binding and has no real effect on the pattern. But when you look at the fabrics closely, you will see this, and it happens quite often. And in weft direction, marked with number three, there is another mark which tells us that they have been woven as one piece. It's a weft that is double and which goes through both pieces as the cutting was not done exactly horizontal. There's even a fourth marker which tells us the direction of the weave, because here, number four, there is a broken warp thread, which is fully complete in the upper half, 
and the lower half. Suddenly, the warp it ends. Uh, the warp ends, and for a small part, there is no warp in this place. And then a blue warp was inserted. So why all this matchmaking? First, grouping the text stars helps us to classify the contexts and it helps to classify themselves and it adds to the text stars um, because there's so many information given on the weaving process and on the looms. Furthermore, it's important to find out if there was a warp-wise pattern repeat as well because in the 3rd to 8th century, important technolo technological changes in weaving took place, which contributed to our modern lifestyle by laying the foundations of computing. Warp-wise pattern repeat must be saved somehow, if there's not just two other one, um, one go and one repeated go. The complex weaves got more and more sophisticated, and some kind of standard weave for pattern silks emerged. The predecessors of the drawloom, and maybe the drawloom itself, was invented in this time. But we do know not yet where it was invented, how it looked like, and how it exactly worked. More knowledge on this will bring us closer to the place of the origin of the compound fabrics. But, as the title is reconstructing the practical approach, I have some treat for you as well. <laughs> we do have... Um, as I'm very, very happy that we do have this small research project in Krefeld, funded by the Sparkassen Kulturstiftung. Uh, the German Textile Museum in Krefeld in the Haus der Seidenkultur joined the knowledge and the workforce in this project called Silk Splendor from Antiquity Recreated. It is running until December and combines theory and practical approach. The German Textile Museum holds a remarkable collection of Roman to early medieval compound fabrics and we did choose some for reconstruction um, on grounds of their um, pattern width. So pattern width of this one is 8 pattern warp threads, 35 pattern warp threads, 64 pattern units per pattern width, and again, 215. And the second pillar of the project um, are the silk weavers from the Haus der Seidenkultur. They are silk weavers which were educated as such, some on jacquard looms, and um, they really contribute a lot with all their knowledge and their experience in silk weaving. Together we develop patterns, looms, adapts in our weaving samples. And as always in reconstructed projects, time is an issue, but with their help it's really easy to get to those reconstructions. And as an output of the workshop, uh, as an output of the project, of course, um, we are setting up a workshop which addresses curators, archaeologists, conservators, um, and it teaches the decomposition of the late Roman compound weaves and gives some hands-on experience. The best way to learn and to sustainable learning is learning with your hands. And so you're all heartfelt invited to come to Krefeld in 2020 to learn about compound weaves.